Hello everyone, Trophy One-Hander. Welcome back to my wine channel. I'm back in Vancouver after traveling to Hong Kong. Hope you enjoyed my videos from Hong Kong. Um, today I'm doing a review. This is not the wine I'm reviewing, but this is kind of for um, just, uh, you know, show purposes, but it will have some um, uh, cognitive or some utility value later on this video. So the, re the wine I'm reviewing today is the uh, Maison or Domaine Chateau 2014 Corton Grand Cru Le Greve. So you might be asking, well, where's the bottle trophy? So I actually reviewed and tasted the wine in Hong Kong. So the last part of this video, you'll see me, um, you'll see me look at the color and actually taste and review it. And I did that in Hong Kong. I was at, I wasn't at my own place in Hong Kong, so I didn't feel right filming there so um, I just filmed the tasting part of it and now I'm back at home it's probably like everyone else in the world that thinks their home uh, locale is the best place so I'm happy to be home and filming back in my normal location so let's talk a little bit about Maison Jadot or uh, Domaine Jadot so the Maison Louis Jadot was founded in 1859 and you'll see that on the bottle by Louis Henri Denis Jadot. But they actually bought their first vineyard um, in 1826, and they still own that vineyard site. It's Claude de Ursula, and I'm probably not pronouncing that right, but I'll have that in the uh, comment section. Jadot is a um, interesting producer because it both it's owns it's a negotiant, so it owns both its own vineyards and also buys grapes from other people in um, Burgundy. So they are a pretty big negotiant. They control about 270 hectares, which is over 600 acres of land in Burgundy. Um, so that's pretty extensive. Um, they were, again, uh, owned by the Jadot family, but sold in 1985 to the Cop Copfi family, who own Cobrand. And they're known for their Bacchus, or, uh, their label is a, the Bacchus um, symbol, which is the god of wine. So that's um, kind of the general information about Jadot. But what I really want to talk about is Corton and kind of me as a beginner in Burgundy, kind of uh, going through the pains of making mistakes, not making mistakes, but kind of um, spending money and in the process um, learning more about wines. And I think that's, you know, you can only make mistakes and I'm happy to share my mistakes with you. So anyways, I bought this wine in Hong Kong at Sogo department store. You'll see the video at the end of this section, really impressed with the selection of especially Bordeaux and Burgundy wines that they have in Hong Kong. You can argue about pricing, but at least they have the selection, which we wouldn't have there. So um, I saw this wine and it was about 800 some odd dollars, Hong Kong dollars, which is kind of about $120 Canadian. And I looked at it, well, it's Corton, it's Grand Cru. It's a great deal. And I'm now doing some research, I still think it's a pretty good deal. It's probably better than what I could get. But as I did more research on um, the wine, I picked up more knowledge about Corton and I want to share that with you in this video. Let's go um, from the basics. So this is a Burgundy wine, and in particular, this Corton is a region in the Cote d'Or region of Burgundy. Cote d'Or has two um, sub-regions, which one is um, Cote de Nuit on the top, and then Cote de Bon. So Corton is in the Cote de Bon region, and if you looked at my other Bordeaux, uh, Burgundy basic series, Again, generalizing the high-end, um, very expensive trophy red wines generally come from Cote de Nuit. The high-end trophy white wines generally come from Cote de Bon. So this is kind of an anomaly. Um, there are other um, red, great red wine regions in Cote de Bon, but this is one of the few um, Grand Cru sites. So. Corton, in fact, is one of the largest, I think it is the largest Grand Cru um, area or region in the whole of Burgundy. And what that means is that that means there's a huge variation 
in topography and also in the quality and in the price. But I'm thinking to myself, well, it's a grand crew, it's Corton, and I've heard of DRC Corton, which is thousands of dollars, so this is, couldn't be that bad a deal anyways. So I bought it, and I'm still happy with the price, but as I did more research, I learned more about Corton. So Corton is basically a hill. And so the, um, the hill is, it faces south, and that's not usual for Cote de, uh, uh, Cote de Bon. On the, generally speaking, on the east side of the hill, that's where the red wines, or the high-end red wines are produced, and on the west side are the high-end, um, the high-end white wines. So you might have heard of a wine called Corton Chalamet, which is a very famous white wine. And so that also comes from this region, but just on the different side of the hill. Corton is made of made up of many communes and the one that this wine that we're reviewing comes from is La Greve and so just noticing on maps where La Greve is, La Greve is at kind of the lower slope of the hill and I just picked out other wines from my cellar and looked at the Corton not noticing them that much before but you'll see this is from Mio Camazet and this comes from the commune of La Perriere and La Perrier is a bit higher, and th that makes sense because this wine is a little bit more expensive um, than the Jadot I bought. So how about DRC? So DRC actually is a blend. DRC Corton is a blend that comes from three different communes in Corton, none of which is the Greve. Um, I think it comes from Perrier and Claude de Roy and an another one. So that kind of makes sense to me in terms of, oh, that makes sense why this wine, I didn't get a steal. I'm not smarter than everyone else in the world. Um, I'm not getting a DRC Corton. So I'm getting a, you know, um, a, a Corton that is um, in a vineyard that's lower on the slope. So probably not as good a um, vineyard site. Now, vineyard site doesn't mean everything, but that has a play in the pricing. The other thing you need to know is that there are kind of um, sub-regions in, in Corton, and one of them is called Alox, Alos Corton. It's, um, in the comment section, I'll have is A-L-O-X-E. I used to call it Alox, but that's wrong. It's Alos Corton. And the, this region is kind of interesting because half of Alos Corton is premier uh, cru uh, sites, and half of it is Grand Cru sites. So where La Greve sits is actually near the border of um, the premier cru sites of Alox Corton, Alos Corton. So taking that into consideration, it's low on the slope, it's closer to the premier cru sites, you're probably kind of thinking that this is going to be a... Um, not a great and not, not as good a site, not the, the prime sites in Corton. So that's kind of helped me in terms of my knowledge of the Corton region. Other thing that um, I noticed is that it's Corton is actually very near uh, Pernar Vercheles. And I'll have another video where I think I drank a wine from Champy from that region, which I recall. So if you're thinking about it, Pernar Vercheles is a premier crew site, but it's very close in terms of, um, you know, the topography to La Greve, which is a lower site in Corton. So then the question becomes, well, do you want to pay for the price or do you want to pay for, you know, perhaps the quality because Pernod Vechelos is going to be a little bit less expensive because it's a premier crew and you're kind of getting a not as good site in a Grand Cru region. So that's kind of something I would also come to play with. Some people might, you know, want, like for me, I was attracted with the Grand Cru label and I wanted to drink Grand Cru. So maybe I'm, you know, shallow, whatever. And then some people might say, well, no, I want the value. I want to be a real knowledgeable person. So I'm going to drink Bernard Vecheles, which might be great for your personal drinking, but you know, it's not going to impress your friends as much as a Grand Cru uh, uh, from a Corton. Let's talk about this wine itself. It's aged in oak 18 to 20 months. 2014, the vintage was 
an okay vintage. It had some hail, but it was also a very mild vintage in terms of temperature. So it was okay. It wasn't the top vintages, but it wasn't the really bad vintages. And what I would say characterized bad vintages, lots of hail, lots of rain. Um, that probably wasn't, wouldn't be great for Burgundy. Um, in great vintages, you're going to have much more stable temperatures, a little bit dry and a little bit, um, a little bit hotter, warmer, but not hot. That would be kind of ideal for um, Burgundy. Characteristics of Corton. In my mind, Corton is um, more tannic and more austere than some of the other um, Grand Cru um, sites in um, Cote de Nuit. Um, so I do find it um, more structured and, um, you know, so, and generally speaking, I would expect a 2014 to take um, 10 to 15 years. So the drinking window would open around 2024, maybe on normal wines. But you'll see in the later part of this video, when I look at the color of the wine, it does show aging. And um, this is one of the things that I found in Hong Kong, that many wines that I drank seem to be... Um, aged more than they would be the same wine in Vancouver. And I think that has to do somewhat with the um, humidity in uh, Hong Kong. It's very humid in the summer and very hot. Um, very similar to what I saw in Paris, where um, it's very easy to um, have wine um, kind of stored incorrectly for a very short period of time. And because of the humid weather, it's really uh, it's challenging for wine enthusiasts to keep um, the wines stored in a condition. And in general, that's what I found with a lot of wines in Hong Kong, that they seemed older than they should be, um, which can be good or bad. So for instance, I drank a Dom Perignon 2008 in, um, in Hong Kong, and it was seemed to me much older <laughs> but I, it was actually quite good because it actually I find Dom a little bit young right now he, when I drink it here but it was actually it tasted like a much older like almost mid 90s um, champagne now I'm not encouraging people to actually not store wines correctly but I'm just saying we got lucky because um, it got oxidized faster than what I would expect in Vancouver but we just got lucky. So don't kind of do that and say, oh, trophy says, but maybe we should just put it out in a more humid environment and, get it, get, and age it quicker because you have to time it exactly correctly. And I think this wine was only bought two years ago, so it was perfect, but you can't really trust that. And, um, you know, had we opened it two or three years later, maybe it would be completely oxidized. So that's not what I'm suggesting, but that I do notice that that was more prevalent in Hong Kong um, and the wines many times seemed more aged than I would expect. You'll see that in a lot of my reviews and also I saw that in restaurants that I drank. Um, so that's something that Hong Kong um, viewers should really keep in mind that it's really, really important to keep your wines stored correctly and to buy them from reputable sources and to buy them early um, to once they're released to get them home quickly and to take personal ownership of this because again the more people that are handling the wine that don't have a love of wine um, will um, you know have a problem and in particular you know it is popular in Hong Kong to have lots of people that work for you and so if those people are not um, knowledgeable about wines they probably don't, wouldn't know um, an expensive wine and wouldn't know that um, it's not um, you know what the how how important it is to keep temperature control um, and humidity control of a wine even for a short period of time like four hours that was a little digression um, but um, the rest of this video you'll see I filmed in Hong Kong you'll see the bottle and the um, color and then you'll see my tasting notes so I hope you've enjoyed this video and um, I hope you'll enjoy the last part of this video also so here is the cork which is nice and long uh, for extended aging, 2014, Corton, Greves. This is the bottle, Chardot, since 1859, 
Grand Cru and uh, the back not much there and then the color you'll see it is a little bit um, rustic all crimson red but a little browning on there so that means it's probably pretty ready to drink at this point so here I'm gonna taste the wine and I'll let you know that I have had it open for a, about a day um, it is kind of tannic in style I, that's what I've realized with Corton it's quite tannic um, on the smell you've got the um, red fruits and strawberries and cherries they got a little bit of oak influence and some earthiness so it's got some heaviness to it um, for a for a um, uh, the um, a, a pinot from burgundy and it's not light at all on the taste light to medium body but medium tannins it's got a firmness to it. It's got a, a, um, a little bit austere. Um, the fruits are coming out. So it's got cranberries, strawberries, um, ripe um, tart cherries, maybe some pomegranate, and then some uh, really some earthiness and some oak elements at the end. Um, really nice wine. It's really um, uh, kind of uh, mellowed out the second day. Um, but it's one of these wines where it's really hard if you break it down you're thinking it looks very simple but I somehow I like tasting it and it tastes really good um, I'm gonna give it a 92 point rating uh, I really enjoy this wine it's a great price really happy to find this wine in Hong Kong until next time happy drinking